Good morning and welcome to the Harry Jackson Show. I'm your host, Harry Jackson, and I'm here to celebrate Faith and Family Day. We are going to have a great program today. David Parlett is with us. He's all wrapped up like an Eskimo, and uh, I'm wrapped up like an Eskimo's brother, too. And we're having fun in Washington, D.C. area. And the snow and the winter has challenged us for a while. And we need more faith uh, because of it. Today we're going to be... Yeah, yes. I was going to say we need more money to pay for these heating bills. Well, it's going up in D.C. for sure. Snow removal is also great. If it snows more than a half an inch here or if there is any kind of ice, we have issues in D.C. And uh, we have a few. Yeah, right. We've shut the government down more than once this winter. We have. And uh, one was shut down financially without the snow. And then we've had a lot of snow and ice that shut us down. So we're not breaking the charts on efficiency. But uh, that's a whole nother story. In the second segment of the program, we'll be talking about responsible entertainment. And Melissa Henson of the Parent Television Council is going to talk to us about this important topic. I don't think you're going to be bored at all. It's not, in my thought, a typical discussion around this issue. We know that we don't want equivalent of soft porn, bad language, a lot of violence. But it looks like there is an encroachment afoot in several different areas that seems to be more subtle. And we're going to talk about the subtlety of the advance against common sense. And we're going to talk about some of the programs that we love. I'm going to ask you about a couple of my favorite programs whether they are in the pale of orthodoxy or not, such as The Arrow, a new program. I'm loving it. I'm wondering whether she loves it. All right? So that's going to be interesting. And then my all-time favorite, Walker, Texas Ranger. Whether that was a good program or whether the way violence was depicted in Walker was actually a deterrent. Now, I like a good choreographed kickbox and beat him down with the bad guy <laughs> movie or any kind of TV show. But is that an, an aspect of aberrant character development on my part? What do you say, Dave Parlett? You know, the, ve- the vegan from Maryland. I was always wondering about you in that department. Now we know. <laughs> <laughs> You loved hey, but Walker, I, Texas Ranger. Yeah. I stopped short of chainsaw murders. <laughs> but this, this dude is bad. I mean, when he shows up on the scene, everybody's scared. You're, you're talking about Walker Texas, or the arrow? Texas, Texas, well, yeah, both. Both, yeah. both. The arrow is on another level, but he still has a good versus bad concept. <clears throat> Except one show, they brought in a lesbian love scene so we've got almost to the end of the second season everything was going fine and then all of a sudden they have this lesbian love scene and it's interesting we'll talk about it later and uh it it, what what we're going to say parents is not uh r-rated or anything of that nature but that seems to be one of these ways we deal with people's ideas, mores, concepts, concerns. And uh, so it's going to be an interesting discussion about where things are going. Modern Family is another one uh, that's amazing. Some of the best writing on TV is on Modern Family. with two gay guys adopting a little Chinese daughter, a older white man with a young, hot Latina mom and a precocious son who asked the dad all kind of crazy questions, a couple that's married, and the man is very soft. On the surface, he looked more gay than one of the gay guys in the gay marriage, but he's hetero. His wife 
is attractive, but a little bit on the kind of macho side, if I can say it, and a little bit off. She's got a little quirky personality. So it's an interesting show. What are these things? They Some of them wouldn't be totally off um, the Richter scale, but should we even allow this dip over into the questionable areas? So Melissa Henson is going to be with us after the break. And Parent TV Television Council, six stories that Dave Parlett is going to go over in eight minutes. Are you ready? We're ready. All right. Ding. The game is on. (laughs) President Latino favor. He had a meeting evidently last night. David Parlett, front page of Washington Post. Obama's Latino support is wilting over deportation. They said at this meeting that he's deported more Latinos than anyone before. And all of a sudden, there is a huge, huge backlash. In other words, it sounds like they finally caught on to the fact that under President Obama, there was an increase of deportation. And then they were voting for him to fix and reform immigration. It's almost like he heightened the problem in order to be seen as a hero. And they had the nerve at the museum last night to call him out. What say you, Dave? Perlet? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, he has deported two million illegal immigrants. And so there's certainly uh, a change in his position. Uh, they say in the last year and a half, 19 percent of his support have dropped. And uh, they're calling him now the deporter in chief. He's te- he's tweeting out last night. Hey, I- I'm your champion in chief. They said, no, we're scared of you, Mr. President. If we sign up, <laughs> we give you our information. Are you going to send? We're scared of you. Uh, right. Are you going to send uh, some immigration officer knocking on our front door? Are you going to deport us, too? We're not giving you our information signing up for the health care. Well, more settled than that, I think you're right. But deporter in chief, if you heighten the awareness of an issue by worsening the problem, it's actually a con game. And it's not that his position has changed. But rather, he's used the power of his office one left-handed way and then one right-handed way, one way above board, one way under the table. Let us know what you think about this at Bishop Harry Jackson, hashtag the Harry Jackson Show. Do you think that the increased deportation while favoring immigration is, in fact, a manipulative political ploy. Come on, we need you to weigh in on this. My listeners out there at Bishop Harry, hashtag Harry Jackson Show, is this a tactic that is insincere in order to make it feel like that the Latino community has nowhere else to go, no safety zone except into the arms of the Democratic Party? Or are they just like blacks? in an adulterous relationship, so to speak, with the Democratic Party. Who comes to their door at midnight, the Sunday before the Tuesday, knocks on their door, and they want what they want the way they want it. And, and, you know, they come in and demand, and then when they leave, they don't bring me no flowers, they don't send me no cards, and I don't get no romance, and there's no dinners involved. It is a mess. There is just a one-way disadvantage to their community. What say you? Does it sound like that? Oh, that's, that's what's going on. The, 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 uh, the Democratic politicians say, give me your vote, whether you're black, Hispanic, and, uh, but I'm leaving you on Wednesday. I said this in 2006 on a platform with Farrakhan, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, Cornell West, with Tavis Smiley, and the audience in that church laughed and clapped, and, and they understood that the Democratic Party had them in a headlock or worse. And that's really something. 
Number two story, everybody loves Christy. What do you think about the fact <laughs> that the conservative groups that is here in Washington, D.C. right now stood up, gave a standing applause at CPAC to Chris Christie? Is it sincere love, or are they playing the same kind of game as Obama? What say you? Ooh, they they may be desperate. Uh, Christie is in a place where he's telling us he's more conservative. He's got a stronger pro-life stance. The CPAC people are accepting ex- accepting him. Get it out. <laughs> is that right? And uh, so they they may be a little desperate, They're looking for a strong leader. There's no question he has strong leadership skills. Will he make a great comeback for the Republican Party? Well, it's going to be interesting. But it looks like they're making an overture to him. And uh, I wonder what Rand Paul had to say about that. And uh, Rand Paul, we'll talk about this more in another uh, session, is beginning to be one of the guys that I think has got some real potential. And I met with him the other week. Really like Rand Paul, Chris Christie. I like him, but he needs to watch out. We have a dominator-in-chief maybe with him as opposed to a dominatrix-in-chief with Hillary. What do you think? <laughs> it, 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 it may be an interesting battle in the political realm. What about sexual assault in the Army? Probably the last story we're going to get to. At the third section, we'll talk about abortion clinics closing in Texas, dangers of daylight saving time, and birth control versus promiscuity, whether birth control causes it. But let's really take a moment to look here at Army sexual assault. Can you frame the question for us? Two women faced off recently in a battle over sexual assault cases in the military. Can you give us a background on that, Dave Perlet? Just a little bit here that uh, they really don't have anyone protecting them if they, and they did not, the, the military will not remove those generals and those leaders overseeing these sexual assault cases. So it's kind of like the fox guarding the chicken coop. They, wow. say, they say that these court cases of sexual assault that actually happened uh, should be taken to another court outside the military so they can have a fair hearing. Well, that's interesting. What do you think? Do you think there's something to that, yeah. that there's a culture? Yes, absolutely. There's, there's no question. I, I, I would tend to agree. Somehow the culture of misogynistic culture, uh, taking women for granted, taking advantage of women. On one side, we have civilian people over the years, trying to push women engagement in the military, there seems to be also a disproportionate number of women with sexual identity issues in the military. There seem to be a lot over the years, historically, lesbian women in the military. And uh, so I'm not sure how we get at this except that it looks like the aberrant behavior is being endorsed in this, quote, macho environment. And I don't know how you stop it other than having some directives coming from the top, but there has to be a clarity that people are going to be prosecuted, drummed out of the military, if you even think about making snide remarks and intimidating or harassing. But they've got full-blown rape going on in the military. I don't see how you stop it unless you have justice that is swift and that comes from the outside. Any suggestions by you, Dave? Yeah, no, I, I agree. You've, you've got to come from a outside court uh, because even the people on the inside themselves are – uh, raping women, and these are actually some of the prosecutors who are also groping. One of the issues in, in the news here are they're going to a sexual assault 
training and even the leaders are groping the women in this case. So that it's was totally specific, out of control. Yeah. That was a specific case that you're talking about. Somebody came up on charges for groping a lady while they're at a conference talking about how do we stop sexual assault. The height, I'm going to say, of the dog factor was real heavy on that brother. Yes. Harry Jackson Show. We'll be right back after this break. With today's Faith to Action commentary, here's Janet Porter. A straitjacket. That's how the Republican National Committee described the Common Core curriculum in their resolution against it. The RNC resolution calls Common Core an inappropriate overreach to standardize and control the education of our children. It further says, we reject the collection and sharing of personal student data for any non-educational purpose without prior written parental consent, and rejects the Common Core plan which creates and fits the country with a nationwide straitjacket on academic freedom and achievement. And the RNC resolution is catching on. County Republican parties like Cincinnati's Hamilton County and others are passing their own resolutions against Common Core. More and more agree, Common Core is rotten to the core. Visit F2A.org for more commentaries and action steps, along with news, links, and much more for your state. Go to F2A.org. For 2,000 years, Jesus has been judged by how well his followers have imitated him. And sometimes they've made a terrible mess. Even the best of his followers has lived the lifestyle of Jesus imperfectly. And that's given people a reason not to follow Jesus themselves. You may be one of those. You've seen the hypocrites and the confusing divisions. There have been so many wrongs committed in the name of Christ. You may have been personally wounded by a Christian, but none of that was from Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. He didn't say, follow my followers, my leaders, or my religion. Jesus died in your place for all of your sins. He rose from the dead and offers you forgiveness and eternal life. If your trust is in anything other than Jesus, you're hanging on to something that simply will not save you. Only Jesus can do that. Will you follow Jesus? To learn more, call 888-NEED-HIM. That's 888-NEED-HIM or visit needhim.org. My children teach me so much about my relationship with the Lord. For the most part, they are well behaved, but there are those times when they completely disregard my instruction, choosing to follow their own little heart. I noticed early on that when they were caught disobeying, they were usually simply sorry that they got caught. But the older they get, the more they understand love fuels boundaries. When they are caught disobeying, they're actually sorry they disobeyed. There's a huge difference. The distinction is one of godly sorrow as described by Apostle Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians. Whenever Paul had to expose sin, i.e. correct believers, there was no joy except the joy of hope that they would repent and be saved. When you're corrected, are you sorry that you were caught or sorry that you violated God's desire for you? One sorrow produces death and the other produces repentance leading to salvation. With the heart for the urban family, I'm today's urban woman, Miki Addison. Connect with us at urbanfamilytalk.com. Welcome back to the Harry Jackson Show. I am your host, Harry Jackson. And this segment, we're going to be talking about advocating responsible television. In a moment, we're going to bring on our guest, Melissa Henson, Parent Television Council. But first, Pastor Dave is going to give a shout out to one of the stations that we're listening to or listening to us this morning. Yeah, good morning, Arkansas. And today we're broadcasting live on KANX in Sheridan City on 91.1. Uh, that's Ann Warren City on 91.3, courtesy of American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. Just to let you know, Sheridan's the county seat of Grant County. It's uh, 30 miles south of Little Rock, Arkansas, and that's on U.S. 167. Uh, it's also the county seat of Bradley County, Warren is, and is located <laughs> on U.S. 63. Uh, it's very close, 47 miles south of Pine Bluff and 48 miles northeast of El Dorado, who we spoke to yesterday. Pastor Dave, you sounded like you actually knew where 167 was. I mean, I feel like I've been there. Well, if you're in Sheridan, reach out at Bishop Harry. 
hashtag the Harry Jackson Show, and we'll give you a shout out. Let us know you're live out there, and uh, we're very thankful we're coming to you. Hopefully, we're giving you a little bit a different slant on the news. My next guest in a second is going to share uh, with us about television, but I'm questioning whether The Arrow is an appropriate show. Uh, it is currently my favorite. Till the other week, they had this lesbian lip lock session that shocked me, came out of nowhere. Arrow is a vigilante who is trying to clean up his city and has got a right and wrong kind of feel to it, which I like on TV. But my favorite is Walker, Texas Ranger. Dave Parlett, you got a little story about Walker. Oh, he What's is, the story? He is famous for his roundhouse kicks, and they got a lot of great jokes about him. So a blind man once accidentally stepped on Chuck Norris's shoe. Chuck replied, don't you know who I am? I'm Chuck Norris. The mere mention of Chuck's name cured this man of his blindness. Well, how to do that? <laughs> because of fear and the power that Chuck has in, in all of creation. But sadly, the first, the last, and the only thing this man ever saw was the roundhouse kick that Chuck Norris delivered to him. So he just beats up everybody. Don't, don't, so, get, don't get in his way. So Chuck healed the blind man by kicking him in the head. <laughs> by kicking him in the head. That's a very endearing and, story, Dave Parlett. Yes. He's, got he's s- my hero. Why are you doing this to Chuck? <laughs> you know, I just thought there were some funny things about Chuck that we ought to talk about on the, your show. Well, but it does kind of bring up the fact that there are certain instances where there's violence and are even on the shows where we think we have a cause Chuck recently became a Christian, all these kinds of things. Um, But are we slipping into darkness regarding how we deal with violence, how we deal with sexuality, nudity, language? Melissa Henson is going to bring us some clarity. Good morning, Melissa. Welcome to the Harry Jackson Show. How are you today? Thank you for having me on. Well, what a privilege it is to have... You, what do you think? I know you're going to talk about uh, Cartoon Network and Adult Swim in a moment, but what do you think about Chuck Norris? What do you think about Walker, Texas Ranger? Is he is he okay? Thumbs up, thumbs down, or do he, does he get a sideways thumb? Yeah, it's. I would say a sideways thumb. Um, it's. The, I mean, oh, no. <laughs> it was a, a fairly violent show, but the violence was mostly bloodless, right? I mean, it was mostly yep. fist fights or you know, uh, roundhouse yeah, kicks. Cor- as you were saying. So, um It's it's certainly not graphic or intense violence, but but you know, if you're if you're um, if you if you have young kids watching TV, it, it might be a little too intense for for the smallest members of the family. Melissa, I was liking you based on your your resume, but now you're troubling me. Yeah, and now you don't like me anymore. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You still get a thumbs up. And uh, But I do like Walker in this show named Arrow. Similarly, probably dipping into inappropriate areas. And you're really hot under the collar, so to speak, about the way the Cartoon Network is also moving maybe more aggressively in the wrong direction. Would you explain that to our listeners? Yeah, yeah. Um, Cartoon Network, some time ago, and I don't, I, I don't know how many years it's been, uh, but they, they have a segment that they called Adult Swim, um, yep. where they, they're still airing cartoons, but they are definitely not kid-friendly cartoons. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're cartoons that are very graphic in nature. In fact, for a time, uh, Family Guy, uh, had been dropped by the Fox Broadcast Network, and it was picked up by by Cartoon Network and aired during their Adult Swim segment. Um, and if your listeners are familiar with Family Guy, I mean, here's a show that that sounds innocuous. I mean, what, what could mm-hmm. be objectionable about a show called Family Guy? But when you actually look at the content, um, you know, they make jokes about incest. They've got a recurring character who's a pedophile. Um, they uh, they 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 have jokes about all kinds of, of disgusting, aberrant, uh, 
disturbing behaviors, and, and they make light of it. They, they they treat it like it's it's fodder for jokes. But that's unfortunately very typical of the programming in the Adult Swim segment. Um, what concerns us is that Cartoon Network recently announced that they are making the Adult Swim segment air earlier in the evening, so right at the start of prime time. So if your child is watching cartoons, you know, something like Scooby-Doo or something like that on Cartoon Network, um, and many parents do let their kids watch cartoons on Cartoon Network because during the day it's largely kid-friendly programming. Um, you know, without changing right. the channel, without flipping a switch, all of a sudden they're going to be exposed to, if they're watching past 8 o'clock at night, they're going to be exposed to um, all kinds of disturbing behavior. Um, and again, you know, we, wow. we did a study looking specifically at the content on Cartoon Network. And we found, um, you know, references to... Um, 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 sexual organs, we found references to pornography, references to rape, pedophilia, um, all kinds of disturbing content. Uh, and again, this is on a network yeah. that during the day is marketed to kids. I can't really believe, I mean, I believe your report, but it shocked my sensibilities that pedophilia, a character with that problem, is being presented in the context of this whole thing. Uh Shouldn't that or wouldn't that promote this uh, aberrant behavior? I think it's still okay to say it's aberrant, that being a pedophile, preying on underage children is definitely not acceptable under any circumstance. So I, I, I don't get it. So, wow. Yeah. Elaborate yeah, and, a little bit well, more on, on that. For example, in in the case of Family Guy, uh, you know, the character is, is not one of the primary characters, um, but Quagmire, who is one of the primary characters, is uh, also a sort of a sexual deviant, and, and it suggests that he's a serial rapist, um, but, but he's one of the primary wow. characters on the show. Wow. 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 So, so really, in today's culture, we're making fun and light and almost becoming mentally numb to the fact that there's sexual deviancy uh, and our children being exposed. In fact, I looked at your website. Uh, it says that the average age for a child's first exposure uh, to pornography, even on the Internet, is just at 11 years old, and uh, it, it occurs right there in the house on the television or the Internet. How, how do you protect your kids from this? It is, it is increasingly challenging, and especially in this age of smartphones, Internet-connected phones. Um, so even if you have very strict household rules about media content, as soon as your child leaves your home, um, if they have a friend who has a smartphone or if, or if you've given them a smartphone, they have access to all manner of content, um, pornographic content over the Internet. Um, they're able to stream video from, from some of these programs that we're talking about. So it is, it is increasingly challenging. And I think the best thing that we can do um, is, we, you know, unfortunately, I think in, in some respects kids are having to grow up faster today than ever before. Um, so we have to be prepared to discuss these issues with our children so that we can give them the right grounding so that when they are exposed to these things, um, they know the correct way to react. You know, if, if a friend wants to show them something on their phone, then, then, then we need to give them the tools to be able to say, no, um, that's not right, I don't want to do that, it makes me uncomfortable, or, or, or whatever. Um, we also need to, unfortunately, uh, be, be able to talk to our kids about, you know, the fact that pedophiles exist, and no, they're not, you know, uh, cute, cuddly little characters like they're presented on television. They're, they're, they're predators, and, and they hurt kids, and, and we have to, unfortunately, prepare our kids for those, you know, in, a, in an age-appropriate manner. But but if if they're they're only uh, the the only messaging they're getting about these issues is from these cartoons, then then they're going to be walking away with entirely the wrong idea, you know. And and um, we could look at things like the Steubenville rape case, or a few years ago there was a 15 year old girl who was gang raped while waiting for her dad to pick her up from a school dance, and a crowd of some two dozen people stood by and watched, and nobody stepped in to help this girl. And in fact, some people in the crowd got involved. 
um, you know, it participated in the rape, and, and others wow. documented it on their phones. And you have to ask yourself, well, how do we get to this point as a culture? How do we get to this point as a society? And I have to think it's because we've become inert to it. You know, we've become desensitized to it by, by um, TV shows and, and media that, that, that makes light of it, that makes it seem like it's inconsequential. Um, and, and I think if, we, if we're going to correct mm-hmm. that, then we need to, to make sure our kids know that it's not inconsequential, that, that this is a serious subject. And it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be just laughed off the way it so often is in these animated programs. You're listening to the voice of Melissa Henson, and uh, she is of the Parent Television Council. And in an article uh, that just came out in February... I want to quote something, have you respond again, back to Adult Swim. It reads, Adult Swim has a long history of marketing explicit animation to children. The network announcement claims that they are targeting adult males by moving Adult Swim to an earlier hour, but in the process, the network is throwing children under the bus. One more sentence. The PTC's research found that Adult Swim includes some of the highest levels of explicit content and failed to appropriately rate sexual content, suggestive dialogue, and explicit language 100% of the time. So Adult Swim, they are the bad guys. And this is the tip of the iceberg of an encroachment. Go ahead. Yeah, and that's that's another huge problem with this this programming block is that um, even though the content that they're talking about is very mature, um, they're not always rating the programs as for mature audiences only. Um, and because they're animated, I think people are probably going to be more willing to give it a pass or they're more likely if they walk into a room and they see their 14-year-old or 15-year-old son watching, they're going to see that it's a cartoon. They're going to assume, oh, well, it must be okay. Um, but, but I'm here to tell you it's not okay. Um, and if you're using a V-chip or if you're using some other sort of blocking device and you, you've got it set to block out mature rated programs, it's not going to catch a lot of the stuff that's airing on, on, on uh, Adult Swim. And that's, that's what's um, most concerning about this is, is a lot of parents, I think, who, who aren't familiar with the content, who aren't familiar with Adult Swim, will give it a pass because they don't know. And they're, the, the technology that's meant to help them, uh, that's meant to uh, help them protect their kids from this kind of content, isn't going to be helping them in this case. Well, it's very interesting. I want to ask you about a couple of shows in a moment. I want to ask you about Modern Family uh, as an assault against family unit. But what's interesting about Adult Swim is this encroachment. I've turned on uh, that uh, network before, and you know I don't want to sound funny uh, or, or, or disingenuous, but a couple of things they were talking about um, the segments I saw, I couldn't follow the storyline. I didn't even know what they were saying, and I thought it was dumb. It seemed like it was going in an edgy direction, and I turned the channel uh, fairly quickly and looked at a little bit of, of the spy show and something called Chosen and so forth and so on. Um It seems to me, like you're saying, giving kids tools is important. In other words, parents have got to really know the environment their kids are in. But what about Modern Family, which seems funny, it's well-written, but the role model of relationships, two gay men with a child, um, a lot of different things. How would you advise parents if a kid is watching something like Modern Family? Well, um, whenever your child is watching television, I always say it's important that that you watch with your child whenever possible. Uh, Or if it's not possible for you to sit down and watch with your child, um, I would suggest if you have the ability recording the program, uh, if you have uh, DVR technology, use that. 
if you have sort of old school VHS, uh, use that. Record the program if you can uh, so that you can watch it before you allow your child to watch. Um, And you can make the judgment about whether or not this is something that is appropriate for your child. Um, And beyond that, uh, as I said, if if you're able to watch with your child, um, then then when messages come up that, that are... Well, thank you. This has been Melissa Henson, Parent Television Council. We'll be right back on the Harry You're Jackson Show. The Ankerberg Minute with apologist and television host, Dr. John Ankerberg. You know what Jesus said about Scripture? Matthew 24, 55, he explained that it was eternal. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus also taught Scripture was trustworthy, saying in Matthew 5, 18, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. In John 17, 8, Jesus said about Scripture, Your word is truth. In Matthew 4, 4, he said Scripture is vital. He said man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus considered Scripture essential, and we are called to obey it today. For additional resources, log on to jashow.org. God shows us his love by what he brings into our lives. But Dr. Tony Evans says he sometimes shows us even more love by what he takes away. We'll find out why as we spend two minutes with Tony. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw Adonai. Now, why do you need to know in the year that King Uzziah died that Isaiah saw Adonai? Because it looked like the human king was the key. But the human key died. The thing that you normally look to, the man in charge, he died. But it wasn't until the human king died that he saw who really owned stuff. Adonai was still seated on the throne running the show. You see, sometimes we won't see Adonai until God lets something die in our situation. He kills something we were looking at. He kills something we were depending on. He lets that job go away because we were banking our whole financial well-being on that employment. He lets that person be removed from our lives. He lets something go away, get rid of, get shattered so we can discover who really is in charge here, who really owns here. Because see, Uzziah's will keep us from seeing our own sin. That's why God let Isaiah see his own sin with his tongue when he saw God as owner. Because a lot of us can't see God because we got other Uzziahs blocking the view. The Bible uses many names to describe God. Each one teaches us lessons about his character and capacity that can connect us with his peace and power. Learn all about them in Dr. Evans' book, The Power of God's Names. Get your copy when you visit us at TonyEvans.org, where all the details are waiting for you. We'll be back on Monday to spend two minutes with Tony. Welcome back to the Harry Jackson Show. I am your host, Harry Jackson. Reach out and talk to us about what you think about Chuck Norris and uh, his show, Walker, Texas Ranger. Uh, (laughs) I need to be affirmed here today. My last, yeah, my last guest, excellent guest. I hope to have her back again. Melissa Henson talked, and she gave the brother not a thumbs up. Not a thumbs down, thank God, but a sideways thumb. Reach out at Bishop Harry, hashtag the Harry Jackson Show. Are you for Walker, Texas Ranger? Others of you may have seen Arrow, and I've been loving Arrow, except that these two beautiful women come together, and they put a lip lock on each other that was questionable, to say the least. And... It, it, it just, whoo, it just messed me up. So the Arrow was becoming a hero. DC Comics, as you may understand, started out years ago. Pretty righteously, Superman came out of their group. And that Superman story is actually a parody of 
Jesus Christ. And that he is the ultimate Superman, good versus evil. He leaves his father in another planet, comes to earth as an instrument of salvation. He can do everything uh, except he can't get near kryptonite, was a picture of sin. And he has a arch enemy. What's the guy's name? Mm, Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor yeah. And Lex Luthor sounds a whole lot like, who is that guy? Like Satan. Like Satan, we don't, we don't call Satan Satan. Also, what would you name more like call Luther? Him like the devil. The devil, yes, Lucifer, not Luther. <laughs> Lex Luther, Lucifer. So it, it's pretty overt. You shouldn't be able to miss that. But then, as they went around, went along, they move away from the archetypal good versus evil theology, and they move away. And they get into some murky waters. Arrow could have a redeeming storyline behind it too. The father sends his son back to the city of their origin to, in his name, right the wrongs and deal with the quote quote sin of the city. Except they're getting lost in the murky waters of situational ethics in our day. So, Dave Parlett, do you have a story about? Chuck Norris, you're going to help me redeem Chuck mm. by telling this story. I, I'm going to try. Th- I think you're going to try to redeem. Uh, this is a great story. You got to promise me that you're going to really redeem my hero. Oh, we're going to redeem him with this. All right, folks, listen to listen to Dave. We. This is the latest story. Chuck Norris sold his soul to the devil. Wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, for his. For his rugged, rugged good looks and unparalleled martial arts ability. But shortly after the transaction was finalized, Chuck Norris roundhouse kicked the devil in the face and took his soul back. The devil (laughs) knew that it was coming, and he admitted it. He said he couldn't really stay mad at Chuck for long. He appreciated the irony. So now they play poker every second Wednesday of the month. (laughs) Uh, somebody who wrote that wasn't that biblically versed <laughs> or religious. I hate this. This whole show is is besmirching the name of my hero. And it's showing us, though, that in the entertainment media of our day, we're laughing, having fun. But we do have a problem of blurred lines. And I think that's what Melissa's point was when she gave Chuck a sideways thumb instead of the thumbs up that he deserves, that his violence there was still violent, even though you don't see anybody bleed, even on the rare occasion where somebody dies in that show, it's not an ugly in-your-face thing. It's much more stylized, symbolic, with a clear plot of good versus evil, and with legitimate um, kind of, um, how can I say it, plots that basically say it doesn't pay uh, to do bad things. So, Dave Perlite, let's go back to the Army assault case. Is this something, these issues, two women faced off, two Democratic women, one saying that she's going to, make sure that the culture has changed. She loses by one vote. Another saying that this really doesn't matter. Let's keep the military rolling. Should the average person out there get involved, request some kind of equity in the military or not? Mm. Should this be a big deal or not? Absolutely. In your view, Ab- speaking of cards, <clears throat> speaking of cards here um, from Chuck and, and the devil playing playing poker. But, yeah, the deck is really stacked against these women. Oh, no. <laughs> you had me wondering, what is he going to say now? <laughs> the deck is stacked against these women. They they really they're in an environment in a culture where if you're sexually assaulted, really, you don't have a real chance to to redeem or protect yourself because mm-hmm. uh, the the rulings are given inside this culture that's that's really has a twist to it, and it protects those who are assault the women. Wow. <clears throat> Do you think there would be some correlation between 
the days of Jim Crow in the Deep South where uh, blacks were lynched and they tried to bring the cases to local courts. But a lot of time, the judge, the mayor, the prosecutors were all empathetic with the perpetrators like the KKK of the various crimes. Do you think that's analogous to how courtroom sessions could work under military authority in the now? Yeah, exactly. We agree. Wow. So that that's pretty intense. You know, I think breaking a culture is a very difficult thing. It's going to require some kind of strategic placement of leadership, some reform, some education. Do you think, I know my answer, want to know yours, do you think that the military internally has the moral will to create or change the atmosphere in their environment? Mm, what think not, you? No, not currently. It's going to need some pressure uh, from the politicians to make the change. Wow. So this is one of the rare cases where 100% of the people don't like sudden change. Maybe one of the rare cases where there is needed a huge change and perhaps a shift uh, that will jar things if change is ever going to come. So I, I suggest that maybe we got too little, too late. Eventually, they're going to use outside courts. But if, let's go back to General Petraeus and many numerous folk who violate the code of sexual harassment, if the woman that he's involved in had been in with using Petraeus was inside the military and she scorned his advances, it could lead to sexual harassment case. In a cultural where adultery and all these kinds of things is turned a blind eye on despite the harsh rules that are in place in theory, I think you've got an idea that some of the officers may feel like misbehaving is a part of the non-written perks, and then the lower-level guys are just operating in an amoral morass of sexual confusion. And what I'm going to say is a testosterone-induced, uh, uh, frenzied environment where guys are to wild out, if you will. What say you about that? Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. The, the rules are, are harsh in the sense there would be judicial punishment, but really they're not uh, in force because they're so busy. Our understanding is protecting one another. And, uh, yeah, with a, it's, it's an unusual culture. It is uh, mostly men. you got a lot of guys, a few ladies in there, and so it's testosterone-driven. Uh, it's a very unusual situation, particularly for the men who are even in situations of war. You know, hey, that's that's a bad place to be. You're home, away from your wife, kids. So adultery is, as we've understood, rampant within the military. Will it change soon? Probably not. Even with harsh rules, that's not going to make it change either. They have to have a whole new way of thinking. Well, we celebrate those who are veterans who have served. Uh, my father was a World War II veteran. My uncle <coughs> was an officer, one of the first black officers in World War II, uh, we celebrate them for their service. We applaud their commitment to the nation. We say something is wrong, and even um, there needs to be urgent reform. I'm not clear how to do it. I'd like to bring on some of our friends, former military people, in the, in the days ahead, uh, or General Jerry Boykin, uh, from Family Research Council at some point to talk about changing the military, what it's going to take as a way of creating a route toward advocacy. Tell us what you think. Is the military too lenient on the issue of sexual harassment? 
You can reach us at Bishop Harry, hashtag the Harry Jackson Show. Bishop Harry, Harry, hashtag the Harry Jackson Show. And we also want to know, is it a flim-flam that President Obama has done by pressing down, deporting many, many uh, Hispanic folk and then being the champion for immigration reform nationally? Is that a unethical or edgy kind of practice on his part, insincere, at Bishop Harry, hashtag the Harry Jackson Show. Let us know what you think. And we've got a number of stories that we could hit today, a lot of things. I really want to talk, though, about birth control, a study that came out that it does not lead to promiscuity, Mm -hmm. but more sex if birth control is given to single women with the same partner, how do you feel about that as a issue? Yeah, right. They're giving out free birth control, uh, but they're saying it doesn't mean the the partners. uh, It's not as if they're looking for more partners, but there's more sex, uh, and there's still uh, promiscuity regarding uh, same sex. Or I'm sorry, not same sex, but they're staying with their partners. Get it straight now. Get it straight. Let's get it straight here. They're staying with their partners. So the study is telling us that just because they receive free birth control does not mean they're being more promiscuous, but they're staying with the same partner, just having more sex. Well, I I think that's a problem because you're really beginning to enforce promiscuity. Marriage out of wedlock is a major problem. Kids born to families who are not married, do worse, is one of the problems with poverty in the nation. Seven or eight out of ten black babies born out of wedlock. The overall nation is beginning to see something like 50 percent of Hispanic babies now. And the overall nation is beginning to see an increasing out of wedlock birth level. And with these unwarranted pregnancies, even if the test group is fairly, fairly happy and satisfied. Sounds like somebody is rationalizing away, giving away birth control or encouraging birth control. Obviously, the Roman Catholic Church would not be for it, but I think the secular community that's thinking, irreligious, never goes to church, should understand that we don't want to give birth control packages, let there be a choice, a discipline, a follow-through that leads people into this behavior uh, so that we don't accidentally, oops, mess up and have many more babies without fathers, families, and a sense of identity. Yeah, it's it's certainly there's no question it's needed in today's culture to still have the birth control, free birth control pills. Uh, You're not going to change the whole culture. So it's a, it's a good safety free, valve. Wait, 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 wait. Free birth control pills are needed? Well, we need birth control pills. Do we need to make them free is the question. Oh, good, good. It sounds like you're advocating them free. I'm saying stepping over and making them free is taking down another barrier. Make them at least for the little money it takes. Think about having sex. Go through and get the equipment know what they're doing when they make that step, that at least forces some dimension of accountability. Would you agree with that last statement? Abs- absolutely. Even though you B-rated Texas, Walker, Texas Ranger, all day long, told terrible jokes about him, that last statement redeemed you, Dave Parlett. And uh, we'll be back with you next time on the Harry Jackson Show. We've enjoyed being with you. And I hope you will work with your child to make sure they listen to and watch responsible entertainment as a family or the parent television council suggested. See you again next time on The Harry Jackson Show.